Hating President Trump is their drug in the media. And by the way, to them, it's more addictive than heroin and crack cocaine. Let me explain. Because in their liberal media bubble, a Trump tweet literally sends them into orbit. Alka-Seltzer, in water, they bubble and fizz every day. And it's like a dopamine rush to their brains. The drug is that powerful, they can't duplicate it any other way. Let me tell you how it works. President Trump he usually tweets to get around the media and their twisted, distorted fake news coverage, and rightly so, goes directly to you, the American people. And a lot of times with humor, they can't recognize. And the media then promptly proceeds. They rush to the airwaves, and they try and outdo each other, feigning more outrage than the other one. Here's the latest example. Watch, just watch how the media reacted to President Trump's recent tweets. You can't make this up. 16 tweets today to start the new year. Some of them deeply disturbing. These are the messages from a person who is not well, from a leader who is not fit for office. This is um, language that would have been rejected from the script of Dr. Strangelove. We can't begin to normalize this. Threat from North Korea. Now, not only are they all a bunch of sheep, you notice they all say pretty much the same thing, but they're drug addicts in this sense. They crave their next Trump tweet. They need their fix. And if for some reason there's not a tweet within 24 hours, there's not a comment, there's no fake outrage, well, then they have to latch on to something that'll satisfy their craving. They just race back to their gateway drug. Oh, Trump, Russia, Trump, Russia. But with the Trump-Russia collusion story now falling flat, that's kind of like the equivalent of methadone. It's only a maintenance drug that barely separates them from like a padded room in some asylum somewhere. And for over a year, you have been subjected to Russia, 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 collusion, collusion, collusion. Only thing missing are facts, facts, facts. And the media desperately repeating those words daily, hoping that somehow if they say it enough, it's going to come true. Here's the problem. It's not true. There is to date zero evidence President Trump colluded with Russia. None whatsoever. It doesn't exist. So the media now, they need a new conspiracy theory that they can pass off as news to get themselves, well, back on their drug, get hooked again. And it's actually, in one sense, it's sad because these people really need help. They have no, let's say, they don't want to adhere to truth anymore. That's a sad thing. Now, if you think about it for a second, does the media ever, when you watch the news, do they ever talk about anything Donald Trump that he did is good? Any good news? Any good news with the economy? Or are they just obsessed with tearing this president down because they never thought he'd win? Do they ever talk about the American people, solutions for health care, getting people out of poverty, off of food stamps, back to work? I never hear it. If the media really cared about anything of real importance, then guess what? They'd have to alter their constructed worship, you know, sites of Obama during his failed presidency. And by the way, they would have, in those years, seen the millions of more Americans in poverty and on food stamps. They would have stood up for you, but liking Obama was more important. Now, President Trump's tweets about North Korea, let's get into this. They are perfect examples. What did the president say that is so dangerous that you see them unleashed like they did in the last 24 hours? Let's see. He stood up to a two-bit murdering dictator, and he called him Little Rocket Man. And he said that the United States is not going to be intimidated by his little red button on his desk. And for the media, that kind of leadership, well, they don't like it. It's not good enough since what they're used to and what they personally support are the policies of appeasement. So we have to ask, is there anything that President Trump could do to make the media ever happy in this situation with Kim Jong-un? By the way, a situation Bill Clinton put us in? Now, the press probably wants President Trump. Maybe they'd be happy if he got down on his knees and kissed Kim Jong-un's ring on his little hand.
then they'd be calling for him to get the Nobel Prize. Or maybe the media would be happy if Trump gave billions of dollars in fuel subsidies to North Korea like Bill Clinton did. Or maybe Trump should suck up and grovel to Kim Jong-un, just like Bill Clinton sucked up and groveled to Kim Jong-il, his father. Then Trump could go on TV like Bill Clinton did and tell you, the American people, a massive lie like this. This is a good deal for the United States. North Korea will freeze and then dismantle its nuclear program. South Korea and our other allies will be better protected. The entire world will be safer as we slow the spread of nuclear weapons. South Korea, with support from Japan and other nations, will bear most of the cost of providing North Korea with fuel to make up for the nuclear energy it is losing. And they will pay for an alternative power system for North Korea that will allow them to produce electricity while making it much harder for them to produce nuclear weapons. The United States and international inspectors will carefully monitor North Korea to make sure it keeps its commitments. Only as it does so will North Korea fully join the community of nations. Could Bill Clinton have been more wrong? Or how about this one? Maybe the media, maybe they'd be ecstatic, really, really happy if President Trump sucked up to the Iranian mullahs. Maybe if President Trump sent them another $150 billion like Obama did and begged on his hands and knees, pretty, 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 please, here's billions of dollars. Just please stop saying you're going to wipe us off the face of the earth. Please stop saying you'll destroy Israel. Please stop burning our flags. That's what they want in the press? That's pathetic. It's weak, and they're not doing a service to you, the American people. I've said this many times. They are lazy, and they are overpaid, and they are a bunch of, of, of sycophants that all retweet each other in their little media bubble. The sky is literally, you know, falling down for these people, all because Donald Trump dared to stand up and challenge a murdering dictator. The media lives in this bubble. These people are stepping all over themselves. They want to all outdo each other. It's like a competition. You know, let's see who can be the most anti-Trump. And if one liberal media personality says President Trump is demented, then another has to step in and say, no, he's really, really demented. And he's really, really a big, 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 big liar. And it goes on from there. See what I mean by drug addiction? It's, it's in, like in part, it's like initiation into their hate Trump club. And to be a member, you just have to hate everything. And it's happening every single hour of every single day on every single news channel and in the mainstream media nonstop. That's all they do. That's their go-to. And that is what now the media in this country has become. And it's why I've been telling you since 2007 and 8, journalism in America is dead. It's done. These so-called journalists, they don't care about truth anymore. Facts be damned, evidence be damned, because if they did care about truth, then they'd actually start doing their jobs, because we know of crimes committed. They'd be investigating massive scandals that are staring them right in the face. They could win their Pulitzer Prizes they're dreaming about. None of what we're about to tell you is important to the media, but it all should be. They're not doing their job. It's about the system of justice in America. It's now hanging in the balance, balance, equal application under the law. The media ignores this. Why? Because they need their Trump hate addiction fix. You know, an explosive report, The Hill's John Solomon, revealing that written FBI documents show agents working on the Clinton email investigation all believe laws were broken. In addition, 17 witnesses interviewed after James Comey already drafted the exoneration statement of Hillary. The fix was in. It was rigged. It was exoneration before investigation. We have even more proof. Does the media even care about it? Or are they spreading their Trump-Russia conspiracy theories? Is that more important after a year of no facts and a year of anonymous sources? How about, you know, Trump-hating and Clinton-loving FBI agent Peter Strzok and his FBI lawyer girlfriend, Lisa Page, completely trashing President Trump on text messages? They called him a lonesome human being, an idiot. And Strzok and Page also talked about an insurance policy in Andy's office, which we believe is the deputy FBI director, Andrew McCabe, in case Donald Trump won the election. And remember, it was Strzok and Comey. They're the ones that changed the, the verbiage in the exoneration letter before the investigation was done. None of this is important to the media. It should be. There's special counsel Robert Mueller. 
his merry team of Democratic generous donors. They don't donate to Republicans, 50 grand to Democrats, including Hillary and Barack Obama. And of course, none of them gave to President Trump's campaign. One of Mueller's lead investigators, Janie Ray, actually represented Clinton and the Clinton Foundation in 2015. You can't get a bigger conflict of interest. Nothing from the media. And we have Mueller's top prosecutor, the expert Andrew Weissman, the professional he is. He led the extremely controversial obstruction of justice case against Arthur Anderson Accounting as part of the Enron scandal. He destroyed that company, cost tens of thousands of people their jobs, and was overturned in the U.S. Supreme Court in 0590. Yeah, that's a great guy to put on your team. And then he also sent four Merrill Lynch executives to jail. Their convictions were also overturned. That case by the fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. Does the media not care about any of this? If it was a bunch of Republican donators, donors and, and giving donations to Trump investigating Hillary Clinton, don't you think it would be the biggest story ever? Really? Now, next, of course, you have the demoted DOJ official Bruce Orr, his wife, Nellie. Bruce Orr meets with members of Fusion GPS before and after the 2016 election. And Nellie, his wife, Nellie Orr worked for the firm that Hillary Clinton and the DNC paid to produce the fake, phony, propaganda Russian anti-Trump dossier. And then finally, the FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe, his wife Jill, gets 700 grand from a longtime Clinton ally. Remember, former Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe? Democrats, all that money given for a failed Virginia state Senate run? That is an astronomical sum in a Senate race in Virginia. These are all individually massive stories, not even mentioning Uranium One, about, let's see, bribery, extortion, money laundering, kickbacks, and they knew it before CFIUS, before nine separate agencies approved of giving 20% of our uranium, knowing that Vladimir Putin's thugs were in America trying to get a foothold into the uranium industry in our country. We don't have enough. We need more. It's insane. Then you look at the money behind that. You have mountains of evidence here of wrongdoing. The media is not touching any of it. Why? Because the media is infatuated. They cannot control themselves anymore. And it's all about hating President Trump. It's kind of like a sickness. Doesn't have a cure. Apparently never will. They can't see anything else. That is their singular focus. Even, by the way, they would prefer kissing the rings and backsides of dictators. The media is betraying you, the American people. Now, you would think the press, you'd think they'd have some sort of ethical compass, something that would move them towards truth. But they're now so corrupted, morally bankrupt, they hate any and everybody that doesn't do it their way. The media tonight, they're hyperventilating. Again, foaming at the mouth. The back and forth between President Trump, former White House advisor Steve Bannon. President Trump responding to comments Bannon apparently made in his soon-to-be-released book by Michael Wolff. Here's the thing. The media loves, loves Steve Bannon for the moment. They love when Republicans or conservatives are fighting and create a circular firing squad. In real life, they hate Bannon and they hate Trump. And, but they'll, you know, right now they'll be supportive of Steve Bannon if, he th if they think he's advancing their cause. They love these intramural fights. They love palace intrigue. They love to analyze who's up, who's down. It's another example. The media's priorities are so screwed up. When do they ever talk about you? When do they ever talk about making your life better, your kids' lives better? Here's another thing that I've said before. Anyone who works in the White House, they're there to serve the country and the president. That's it, and the American people. And that should be the main goal. People asking me all day today, what do you think about you know, this? I think this. I think the agenda of the American people is point one, two, three, four, and a thousand. And that should be the focus of everybody. This isn't going to be a story in 48 hours. Instead of blowing this out of proportion, like the media always does, maybe they should be focused on this. Look at this painting. It's by John McNaughton, guy that's out in Utah. Great guy, great painter. I bought that original painting. See that guy sitting on the bench? He represents, that's called the forgotten man painting. That represents the forgotten men and women in this country. All those people in poverty, all those people in food stamps, all those people that don't have jobs, we should be focused on creating jobs, energy independence, securing our borders, fighting back against radical Islamists, rebuilding the military. 
That's where my focus is. Joining us now with reaction, former deputy assistant to the president, Fox News contributor, Sebastian Gorka, former Arkansas governor, Fox News contributor, Mike Huckabee. Uh, here will be the headline, Dr. Gorka. Hannity says media is like drug addicts. And you know what? I do. Because they wake up every day and they've got to hate this president. And they have ignored so much. What do you think is going on? Uh, Sean, Happy New Year. That was quite the monologue. I'm going to go one step further. Uh, in the commercial breaks between the CNN uh, segments, I think they're handing around a crack pipe of Trump hatred. The, the analogy is perfect. They need that dopamine dump because none of it is logical. As you've said, for the last 11 months, they haven't been able to say one positive thing about this president's work, whether it's the stock market, the jobs, the securing the border, the defeating ISIS, none of it matters to them. It's all obsessive, psychologically obsessive hatred of a man who they don't understand and all the people who voted for him. They don't understand what happened on November the 8th and they still don't get it today and that's why the hatred continues to build, but they just make themselves irrelevant, Sean, and that's great for Fox and that's great for all patriots. Governor, I got to imagine it's a little more personal for you when the media is sitting there attacking your own daughter and questioning whether or not she told the truth about making a pie and they want proof that she made a pie. Uh, I mean, that's how idiotic and superfluous some in the media have now become. Well, first of all, I can tell you she made the pie because she made it for us at Christmas. So that that I can confirm. I'm glad I wasn't but I there because I was on a diet, with both. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want this pie. But I got to disagree with both you and Dr. Gorka. Here's the reason. You've said that the media are like drug addicts, and, and I think that's being very unkind to the drug addicts, because I've known a lot of drug addicts, Sean, and a lot of them actually go into rehab and they get better. The press never gets better. They keep getting worse. They, they become more obsessed with the destruction of Donald Trump than they are with the building up of America. This is a president who's had a remarkable year. Oh, yeah, he says some things in tweets that drives everybody off the, the ranch. But the truth is, our economy's better, our security's better. We're trusted by nations that hated us before and didn't trust us. The Middle East is rapidly changing in a positive way. He's had the guts to stand up for the Iranian people against their autocratic, totalitarian, brutal, terroristic government. And they can't see any of that. Drug addicts sometimes have good days. I just don't know that the media is capable of having a good how day, Sean. They ignore, They're just not able. How, how do they ignore all of this truth about lawbreaking and corruption? How do they not tell any good story for the most part, Dr. Gorka? Very, very little. How is it possible that, they own, that they're so myopic that there's, there's nobody in charge saying, Guys, we're a little bit biased here, and it's really obvious. This is now a crisis of confidence in what we do. I got to imagine there's somebody that wants to be a professional. I think the answer is very simple, Sean. I think you, you alluded to it in your, your monologue, because it's no longer about the truth for these individuals. It's no longer about really performing a public service. Journalism used to be about uh, informing the American people so they, they can make the right judgments, especially when it comes to an election. The media has become like the Obama White House. Narrative is everything. Remember that dedication to Hillary's master's thesis. She said, uh, the fight is everything. It's not about the truth. It's not about America. And if you love America, like this president does, like his family does, then you are the problem. Remember, leadership has been reasserted, whether it's with little Kim in North Korea, whether it's in NATO, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in Jerusalem. American leadership has been reasserted by Donald J. Trump, and they can't stand it because for mm. them, we are the problem. America is the problem. What should take uh, uh, governor on what's going, what happened earlier today with Bannon and, and the president? Well, it's disappointing, and in part because uh, just a few days ago, Steve Bannon was considered by the press to be the unhinged, uh, he's crazy, he's a wild man. Suddenly, this guy, Michael Wolf, quotes him in a book saying terrible things about 
President Trump, and now he's a hero. But I mean, the only gig he's got in his future is perhaps being a occasional commentator at MSNBC, joining the other thumb suckers over there who uh, just can't get enough of themselves. <laughs> but, but Sean, bottom line is this: there are two things you give to someone when you're hired in a political context. You give them loyalty, and you give them confidentiality. Those are the two virtues that are more important than anything else you can bring. And if you see how many people have maybe been in the administration, they've come out, they've had integrity. Whether it's Sean Spicer, Reince Priebus, Sebastian Gorka, there have been a number of people who came out, and they didn't go out and trash the president or the other people they worked with at the White House. Steve Bannon said all along that the entire Russia investigation was a farce. Those are his words. A complete farce. Yeah. There was no collusion. Let me, now, Dr. Gorka, whose let me get story your take changed? On. Wasn't Donald Trump's? Wasn't Donald Trump's? Dr. Gorka, Sorry. last word. Look, I'll let, I'll let Steve talk for himself. He's a big boy. Uh, but I know that Mike Wolf is a hack. His last book, 13 people complained about misquoting and being having their quotes. So you uh, suspect he was misquoted. I, look, I, there was a, a Twitter t feed tonight quoting me saying something that I wanted to work for Trump. I've never said that. I, if that's I, true, I, in I, there, I, I haven't seen look, the book. I was told to meet with this man as part of his book project. I knew his reputation, and I refused to meet with Wolf. The Guardian is the lowest of the low radical left-wing newspaper. All I know is there is no Russia collusion because the president told me so. Jared, Don Jr., are patriots. I couldn't care less what the Guardian doubt, or Mike Wolf says. You doubt Bannon said it. I wasn't there, and it doesn't sound like... Look, if Steve yeah. wanted to attack somebody, he wouldn't do it in somebody else's book. He'd do it himself. That's the kind of guy he is. All right, guys, thank you. Appreciate it. When we come back, President Trump continues to throw his support for the protesters in Iran as this deadly crisis there deepens. We're going to tell you what it means for your national security. And Dan Bongino sounding off on the former FBI director, James Comey. We'll tell you what he said today and more straight ahead. Good people of Iran want change. And other than the vast military power of the United States, that Iran's people are what their leaders fear the most. Oppressive regimes cannot endure forever. And the day will come when the people will face a choice. Will they continue down the path of poverty, bloodshed, and terror? Or will the Iranian people return to the nation's proud roots as a center of civilization, culture, and wealth, where their people can be happy and prosperous once again? Now, that was the president, that was back in September at the United Nations, predicting the unrest that is now spreading in Iran tonight. Now, earlier today, the president tweeted such respect for the people of Iran as they try to take back their corrupt government. Now, you will see great support from the United States at the appropriate time. Here with the reaction, former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Fox News contributor John Bolton, and National Iranian Congress Senate Chairman, President of the Iranian Freedom Institute, Amir Fakhrova, is with us. Good to see you. And just as we don't have the time like I did on radio today to get into all your background. You're a student pushing for freedom and liberty. You were in prison in Iran mm -hmm. for nearly six years. Every bone in your body was broken. You were tortured. Tell everybody what happened. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. And this is a great opportunity to send a message of um, millions of young people in Iran who are chanting dead to dictator and they are fighting death to the Ayatollah. Regime, dead to Khamenei, dead to Ayatollah, and no Allah Akbar chant at all. That means these are the right keys that the Americans and the international community should have focus on them and should help them because these are the people who can change the entire um, Middle East and entire world. If we can change the regime of Iran, then bring up the democratic and uh, free... Uh, that would mean radical Islamic mullahs that chant death to America, death to Israel, will not be married to nuclear weapons that they seek so desperately. Exactly. And um, if you realize the first question you asked about me, I don't want to talk about myself, honestly. The people can go and Google my name and then they can. Well, I think find it's important. You were beaten. Me. You were. Exactly. You, I was you, every torture. bone in your body was nearly was broken. For more than five years and three months and eight months of solitary confinement and a lot of bones in my body have been broken. But right now, 
my classmates, my friends, they are in the street. They are chanting. They want a better future. Let me ask you. And you have helped organize what's happening today. You are in touch with them every day. How do you win a revolution without weapons? when you have the, the Cuds, the, the Revolutionary Guard, and the other military? Um, first of all, let me uh, um, thank you for mentioning that. The regime is calling, I want to just say the exact quote, they are calling these protests as a spontaneous reaction to economic hardships. And this is coming from the regime. And that's very interesting because some medias here, they are exactly echoing this message. No, this is not correct. These kids in Iran, they right. planned for that. We planned for that because this is a you, revolution. Will this be successful? Revolution. Let me go to uh, Ambassador Bolton. Ambassador, you have been an advocate. I think we made such a big mistake, and, and I'm sure Amir agrees with me, uh, back in 2009. I don't know many, many revolutions that win, win with slingshots and baseball bats if people aren't armed, Ambassador. My fear is we will wake up to a massacre of a lot of these young students. That is a fear that I believe is quite legitimate, sadly. No, I think that's right. And I think, uh, you know, the United States has an obligation here. The president has been correct in his tweets about support uh, for the opposition. Uh, but we have, in our past, called out oppositions into the streets in Hungary and Eastern Europe in the 1950s, uh, in Iraq after the first Persian Gulf War, and then stood by while they were slaughtered. And I don't What should think we, we do? Well, I think we've got to go to the various uh, aspects of the opposition. This is a very complex phenomenon that's going on and see what we can do to help them. I think in the immediate near term, they need communications help inside Iran because the uh, government has been effective in shutting down or slowing down the Internet. I think they need finances so that they can uh, communicate better inside Iran. And ultimately, they may need assistance more than that. Now, the uh, opposition here in the United States, which is pretty fearsome, says, oh, my goodness, that would taint what's going on in Iran. You know, honestly, the people who know best what they need are the opposition figures inside Iran. If they're content to take American and other outside support, I think we should provide it to them. Amir, what would you like this president to do, and how, how is this going to be successful? Do you believe the military will turn on uh, Khamenei? Um, you know, um, my father um, was an Air Force Army officer. I'm coming from the military family, but traditional military in Iran. We know not we the Quds forces, not the revolutionary, revolutionary guard, which guard. their their uh, exterior uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, faction is called Quds Force. This is two different military forces, and the um, traditional army they have been with the people from the day. You believe on. they are today? They are today. We have seen several statements. What about from the revolution? Revolutionary Guard. The Revolutionary Guard, the a body of Revolutionary Guard, right now they are turning their face on their commanders. But the commanders, we cannot uh, just uh, count on them. But um, as you asked uh, Ambassador John Bolton, I want to use this opportunity to say thank you to Ambassador Bolton because he was right all the time when it comes to Iran. He was on the right side of history. Thank you, Ambassador. And about thank what you. the United States can do, and specifically, the, yeah. specifically President Trump. Right now, the people in Iran they are hungry. They love President Trump. They will love him more if he can do something to make sure we will have internet coverage all over Iran, satellite internet. This get the story the out, get the problem. videos out, get exactly. the images out. And then how big is this? How many? This is huge. We are talking about millions of millions of people. Mm -hmm. They need it. They can be the army of the world to make world free from the small group of fanatic mullahs who are in power in Iran. I've got to run. Uh, wish you well. Uh, in your quest for freedom. Ambassador, always appreciate you being on. Thank you, sir. When we come back, the latest, we have the Hill's bombshell report. FBI agents believe Hillary Clinton, in fact, did break the law. Dan Bongino, Austin Goolsby, and later on, well, Joy Behar lost it. You're going to love the video of the day. Straight ahead. And tonight we have more on the bombshell report from the Hills John Solomon about the FBI's probe into Hillary Clinton's private email server. Solomon's report stating that FBI agents in fact believed 
Hillary Clinton and her aides did break the law based on the, quote, sheer volume of classified information that, in fact, passed through Clinton's server. Now, Solomon also reported that 17 witnesses in the Clinton case, they were all interviewed after James Comey had begun writing his exoneration statement. Here with reaction, RNC spokesperson Kelly McEnany is with us and Fox News contributor Sarah Carter. Sarah, before I get to that, I want to start with you. There was a meeting today with Paul Ryan, Rod Rosenstein, and a deadline of midnight tonight. That would be two hours and 23 minutes from now as it relates to uh, Chairman Nunes, Nunes, who has been dogged in demanding documents be handed over by the Justice Department. Where are we with that? Well, we just found out that uh, at this point, at this moment, Nunez did get off the phone with the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, and he will be receiving those documents before midnight tonight. Okay. So well, certainly right. good news. And it's, he's getting everything, or we assume he's getting everything, or he's told he's getting everything? He has been told that he will be getting everything, including dates for the interviews that he's also requested with members of the FBI and DOJ. A good friend of mine, Mike Myers, who's a guest on this program, wrote me today. He says, you talk about Uranium One, you, you talk about the dossier, you talk about the email server, you talk about how the, uh, Comey and Strzok, the fix was in, it was all rigged on Hillary and the email server. When do we get finality? When do we close? When do these sto stories come to a conclusion or the Justice Department give us anything to indicate they're on the job? Well, we've got to know, Sean, one, that the Justice Department is actually looking into this, uh, and we don't know that yet. What we know is that the Justice Department has prosecutors interviewing people with regard to Uranium One. Those are the FBI agents. And we've been told that they're taking this seriously and that they're looking into this. We also need to know that there's, they're serious enough to issue a report, a finding. That's what the American people want. They want to know what did the DOJ but discover. don't we know crimes were committed? Don't we know Hillary committed felonies? There's no, it's incontroversial. Well, it is incontrovertible. If you're looking at it on its face and the recent report by John Solomon, people associated with Hillary Clinton, just look at what was in the report. They know now, Congress knows now, that the person that was working on her server not only lied to the FBI, the person that she had hired, but also deleted everything months before. And, and you know, this is after they had subpoenaed those emails. So this is very serious. These are very serious charges, lying to the FBI. Isn't yeah. that what Mike Flynn, you know, you know I, this, so they exactly. dropped the ball. They dropped the ball on this. You know, I, there was a, a fire. Thank God nobody was hurt. Nobody was at risk at the Chappaqua house, Kaylee, uh, today of the Clintons. And an old boss of mine writes me. He's very sarcastic and very funny. He writes, oh, let's see. First, they tried to delete them. Then they used acid wash bleach pit. Then they broke up their Blackberry. So now they decided to burn the evidence in the Clinton Chappaqua house. He's kidding for those of you that have no sense of humor uh, that hate the show. But in all honesty, they've done everything to obstruct justice. And all of the mishandling is a violation of law. All of it from the get go. And if that's not obstruction, I don't know what is. Absolutely. You mentioned bleach bit. You mentioned that the FBI had evidence of criminality, that they had written that down, and yet she gets the exoneration letter. And I just want to point out, Sean, you showed at the beginning of your show that image of the forgotten man. Well, Navy sailor Christian Saucier today has had his house under foreclosure, uh, his car repossessed. He has lost his job. Seventy hours as a garbage man he works, convicted of the same crime under the same statute that Hillary Clinton got away with. She's at her house in Chappaqua, the forgotten man and woman is subjected to an so entirely different happen, standard Kaylee? of justice. What should happen now that we know the fix was in and that Comey and Strzok and others rigged it? Well, the DOJ should seriously look into reopening this investigation. We hope that seriously, Jeff Sessions... Seriously, or they need to do that? Absolutely. They need to do that. We need answers here. The American people deserve answers because an elite standard of justice is not yeah. justice at all. And Sarah, you, you said last night on the show that you thought Uranium One would be perhaps one of the biggest stories of the year. Is it going to be everything? Do we get finality to the paid for, bought and paid for Russian dossier? Do we get answers why, in fact, 
Mueller and others knew about bribery, extortion, money uh, laundering, and kickbacks, but still allowed CFIUS to go forward. Nine separate agencies all having to approve the Uranium One deal, then the money flowing back. Do we get back to the Clinton email server scandal that would have put people like us in jail? We have to, and we have to hold the DOJ accountable. So the DOJ really needs to look at this. They need to take this seriously. How long do they need to look? I don't have any more patience, Sarah. Um, my patience is running thin. Michael Myers is right. <laughs> well, they, they do. And if they drop the ball on this, they need to answer why they dropped the ball on this. I think it's up to us to hold their feet to the fire. I think that's the most important thing. We can't give up. We have to continue to investigate, and we have to continue to report all these stories. When we stop, they will stop. If we don't stop, they will have to continue. All right. Thank you both for being with us. Great analysis tonight. When we come back, Dan Bongino has very choice words for the former FBI Director James Comey over a, a statement Comey put out today. He'll join us along with our friend Austin Goolsby. And later tonight, our video of the day, Joy Behar. That's all I'm going to say. Her jumping the shark again. We'll show you the tape. Former FBI Director James Comey is taking yet another shot at the president and the people who've been critical of the overly politicized FBI investigation. Comey tweeting, quote, we are all, we are the voices of all the leaders who know an independent Department of Justice and FBI are essential to our liberty. Our friend Dan Bongino, he didn't like it much. He tweeted back, no, Jim, independence isn't what you want. What you're asking for is omnipotence. Your hubris your, was your downfall and continues to blind you. Dan Bongino joins us now, former Secret Service agent, along with our other good friend, former Obama economic advisor, you know, the only president in history that never reached 3% GDP growth in his presidency. Austin, how are you, sir? Happy New Year. 17 million jobs. Okay, well, I won't go down that road because I win. Uh, now, let me go to, let me start with you. Let's just say for a minute that the FBI is investigating Donald Trump and Donald Trump well he let's say he has friends in the FBI and people that are saying things texting things to boyfriends and girlfriends oh I hate Trump he's a loathsome human being and that he and the FBI director they start writing an exoneration of Trump before they do the investigation why do I suspect my friend Austin Goolsby would be up in arms, foaming at the mouth, apoplectic, and saying, this is not how justice should be done in this country? That's a question you're supposed to is answer. Is it to me or to Dan? I said Austin. Oh, well, look, uh, <laughs> I would... Go look, ahead. What I, I thought you were, as you were t talking about Dan's tweet. Look... We want an independent Justice Department. Not if you're upset my question. at Comey, I understand that. I'm old enough to remember when Donald Trump tried to explain oh why he fired Comey. Here's what I want to say. I'm asking you Comey a specific question. If the FBI been too director mean to Hillary Clinton. is giving an exoneration of Donald Trump and he didn't do the investigation and he's writing it, you're telling Look, me you I wouldn't think that's rigged? about that. Answer I, you, the I question. Have to take your word Austin, for that. this is I have really to take important. Take your word for that. If, I know the law states we are not allowed to ask lifetime. FBI, Austin, Secret Service, or other this Justice question. Department people if about three their months, politics. If before You're not he does the main that. interviews in an investigation, he's writing an exoneration. It seems weird to me. Seems and I'm weird not a to lawyer, you. And I don't know the details about it. Well, you need to read more and watch this show. I'm helping to educate you every day. I, well, look, Damn by I watched this show. Go ahead. Sean, uh, Jim Comey oversaw one of the most corrupt investigations of consequence in modern American history. Jim Comey should get off Twitter tomorrow. Jim Comey has a God complex. Jim Comey seems to think that he is the single arbiter of what's true and moral and good in the country these days. If Jim Comey wanted to be a politician and up his clout score on social media, then Jim Comey should have run for office. But this charade, this embarrassing charade, where he pretends that he was above it all, and by the way, he pretends that the FBI should be free of political influence, which it should, by the way, 
while he oversaw an investigation into the Clinton email scam, by the way, Sean, he obstruct which is justice only in your explainable. View? If he's writing which, which an exoneration. Which is only explainable by political influence. <laughs> if he and Peter's... Hang on. If you he, guys have got to be kidding. No, we're telling the truth. You just have to keep Wait, up. You're literally... Uh, about you, what? He called for an independent Justice Department and FBI, and you guys have worked yourself Those to the words. position that we're you're talking about he's deeds. obstructing justice? We're talking about deeds. Let me explain it to you in simple terms. That if you're okay, writing uh, an exoneration... What that's what I need. If you're writing an exoneration with a guy that openly finds this president loathsome, and is writing that to his FBI girlfriend at the time. And the exoneration even takes out the legal standard that Hillary Clinton clearly broke. Mishandling of classified information, destroying classified information, those are both felonies. If you're doing that, you're obstructing the justice process, aren't you, Dan Bongino? Uh, look, I, I know Sean, that you are uh, not Austin, allowed. With, it's a, oh. Yo, Austin, listen I, 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 listen, I have a lot of respect for your economic background. I think you're wrong. But you are so off base on this. I have no respect for his this. economic almost, background. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, he's wrong. But I, you are so off on this, it is incredible. I spent a decade of my life actually working federal cases. Never in my life have I heard of a case where attorney-client privilege is extended to someone who's a lawyer who's a potential co-conspirator in the case, where evidence is given back to the uh, to the uh, the subjects in the investigation before it's concluded and an exoneration letter is drafted before the investigation's even interviewed its prime suspect does this make any sense to you and now you're wondering why we're laughing about jim comey no, and his independent fbi is what thank I can't god understand. for the good men and women of the fbi if you worked in the federal government it was and is against the law for anyone to ask about your politics when they are evaluating you for jobs, career jobs, at the Justice Department. The fact that, the, that this one agent had a political opinion against President Trump, they're not allowed to go ask political, the political affiliations and opinions of career Austin, people. Austin, what about That's the exoneration the letter? You and it should be against the law. This is amazing. I made three points. You addressed none of them. You addressed point number six. I only addressed three. What about the exoneration letter? Your what tweet about has nothing to do back? with the points you're making. Hey, hey, Your Austin, tweet well, was about the was 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 hey, 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 well, Hang on, hang on. <laughs> For the sake of our audience, answer point by point. Point one, the exoneration letter. The uh, point one was about the tweet. Should we have an independent FBI and Justice Department? Yes, we should, no. and the law requires it. So attacking Comey for saying Those that, are I words think, is too. Go ahead. We're... Dan. Yeah, uh, okay, well, you're wrong. We shouldn't. There, that is, we don't have an independent uh, Federal uh, Bureau of Investigation. They work for the Executive Office of the President. I don't know where you got that from. Um, this exoneration letter, point number two, by the way, what do you, I mean, what's your take on the, the evidence? Should we be giving back the evidence, say a murder weapon 